Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we'll do our normal Monday routine where we focus on the market from three directions, top-down macro analysis, bottom-up stock picking, sector rotation as well. Plenty of movement uh, in, the, in the last week or so. We had a shortened holiday week. Things are supposed to be nice and quiet. Friday, a little crazy with markets pulling back. Today, nice recovery day with the move back to the upside. The S&P up 1.3%. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the market environment using charts, using technical analysis and the technical toolkit to better understand the dynamics in the, uh, in the markets. Last week, we took a couple of days off for the holiday. The Friday after Thanksgiving, usually sort of flat to positive and usually one of the lightest volume days of the year, of course. We have the new coronavirus uh, variant announced or uh, discovered, and uh, and the uh, the market's taking a, a bit of a hit there. Nice recovery day today, and I feel like you had the weekend to sort of process things, and uh, and today you get a nice bounce. And overall, what strikes me when you're looking at the market, to be honest, the resilience of the growth trade, the resilience of technology with the the XLK up two and a half percent. You know, we've talked about how the uh, rise in rates and the prospect of higher rates, pro uh, prospect of, uh, of, of higher inflation or continued inflationary pressures and all of those related things should put pressure on the growth trade, should be a headwind or, to that and a tailwind to things like the, the cyclical sectors, things like industrials and, uh, and others. A day like today shows you that despite rates being higher, despite the challenges of inflationary pressures, that the sectors like technology are doing just fine. And again, what this reminds me is to focus on the charts. Don't think about what should should work or what should happen. Focus on what is happening. We'll do our best to uh, to do that together today in our short time together. A couple uh, quick announcements. Uh, guests coming up on the show, really fantastic guests uh, over the next week or two. Tomorrow on the 30th, we have Sean McLaughlin. He's the chief option strategist at All Star Charts. On Wednesday, the first strategist, Tony Dwyer from Canaccord Genuity in New York coming back on the show should be very helpful in helping us make sense of this uh, macro environment going into next year. On Thursday, excited to have Mark Chaikin from Chaikin Analytics uh, join us on the show once again. Next week on Tuesday the 7th, we have Mark Newton from, uh, from Newton Advisors in the, uh, in the New York area. Fantastic guests. We are bringing in the, uh, the top guests to help us make sense of this current environment. A couple quick announcements before we get to our next segment. First off, today is Cyber Monday, in case you haven't noticed from the slew of emails and social media pitches I'm sure you've been bombarded by. However, I wanted to highlight with, uh, with you that this is a really good time to, uh, to re-up or to uh, re-up your uh, Stock Charts membership or take on a new premium membership. There are a lot of really good features. A lot of the stuff we highlight on this show are only really accessible and really only um, you know, uh, helpful, really, really helpful if you have a, a premium membership because it allows you a lot more flexibility, a lot ability to save scans and, uh, and, uh, and custom indicators and things like that. So go to stockcharts.com slash special for information on our Cyber Monday special. I'd encourage you if you've thought about joining Stock Charts or if you're looking to uh, re-up, even if your membership is not due, you can lock in the gains today only. So make sure you check that out before the day is done. Also, Go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch. You will get information on our latest episode, which uh, airs today at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 o'clock Pacific. My friend Tom Boley moderated a really fun conversation earlier today with Julie Stekempner, Dave Landry, and Jeff Huge, who's been, all three of them have been on the show many times and really know their stuff. And Tom is one of the best at moderating a good discussion. Go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch for more info on that. You can see it on Stock Charts TV live today at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. So as I mentioned, right, the overall, the S&P having a nice recovery day after Friday, you know, uh, going going uh, quite a bit lower. And, and again, Friday was sort of a crazy day. You had a light, lighter volume day, which is pretty normal. Usually a lot of people on vacation, including myself and others, just trying to get away from the markets for a couple of days. And of course, 
you're totally drawn back in. Even my wife, we're, we're you know, uh, you know, recovering from Thanksgiving. We're organizing the house, and my wife mentioned you see the markets down really big. And I actually hadn't because I was really trying to unplug as much as you can when you're a, a chief market strategist and your job is to follow the markets. So I did no noodle around a bit on Friday, but tried to uh, limit my exposure until yesterday into today, doing my normal weekly uh, routines. And, you know, overall, I, you know, th this weekend or, or Friday's movement certainly uh, pulled back, but even within the, uh, the uh, margin of error that we've talked about for the S&P, we've talked about S&P 4550 as being the key level. We didn't get to that level on Friday and, uh, and have bounced just finally. So I, I maintain what we've talked about, which I think is remaining above 4550, tells you that this market is still uh, awfully constructive in days like today when Technology is up significantly when semiconductors are the top performing group, which they were earlier today, up almost, you know, four and a half percent. There's a lot to like right now when, if you're if you're looking at equities. The S and P finished today today up one point three percent. Forty six fifty five uh, was the uh, was the uh, closing level. Mid caps uh, flat for the day. Small caps down a bit. Now that usually is a, is sort of a uh, sector driven theme. So you have some of the things like industrials, materials, financials down, and that's uh, those are more represented in the small cap space than the large cap space. So it makes sense that that group, uh, that index was down a little bit. The VIX, by the way, spiked higher. It was uh, uh, just above uh, above 23. It actually got back below 23 uh, here today, down quite a bit, down five points from where it was on uh, on Friday. We might take a look at the chart of the VIX here if I can remember to do so. Got a lot to look at here. Interest rates sort of chopping around. We talk about the 10-year yield being between around 150 and 175. That's the range we saw earlier this year. That's the range we've settled back into. We're testing the lower end of that range. We actually dipped below 150 on Friday session, closed just around that level, and today uh, bouncing uh, further to the upside. So again, my, my general playbook, given the trends that we've seen, are higher rates uh, and, uh, and, and stronger value stocks is what that generally tends to mean. You're really not seeing it on a, uh, on a day like today, dollar index essentially flat from where we were on, uh, on Friday. Commodities overall, you have gold, precious metals weaker, the rest of the group for the most part higher, oil prices up a bit, uh, about 1% using the USO. And energy uh, was basically flat uh, on a relative basis, sort of mid-range for the 11 S&P sectors. Cryptocurrencies had quite a movement. Now those sold off significantly on Friday uh, with Bitcoin uh, coming off quite a bit. Ethereum actually went below 4,000, just touched it. Uh, over the weekend, but bouncing back to the upside up another 10% uh, from where it was uh, over over the weekend. And uh, Bitcoin actually touched 53, just below 54,000 and uh, rallying back to uh, to above 58,000. So quite a lot of movement. That ended up being sort of a risk on risk off measure uh, over the weekend for sure. Let's look at a number of these macro charts if we can. Again, we're going to get into sectors and individual stocks later into uh, in today's show. So this is the base case on the S&P that I've sort of been working from. And I cleaned this up a little bit uh, this morning as I was uh, preparing for the show. You know, when we're looking at it. The reality is every month we've seen a new all-time high in the S&P, including September, which just barely did it at the beginning of the, uh, of the month. But, you know, overall, this has been a story of a resilient uh, S&P continuing to push uh, higher. And the same thing with the NASDAQ 100, continuing to see further uh, upside movement there. We talked about, you know, I, I tend to think of the market to, in any chart in, in terms of lines in the sand. And that is, once you make a new high, you define a line in the sand. As long as we remain above that level, things can't be that bad because we're remaining above that first line of defense, that first level of support. I think for the S&P 500, that's around 4550. That's the uh, high from early September. That was the breakout level in late October. We've remained above there. As long as we remain above there, overall, things aren't that bad because we're still above that last breakout. The 50-day moving average, notably, is just below there around 4530. So you have a cluster of support levels to pay attention to. That holding, I think, firmly uh, keeps this bull uh, trend in place. It keeps the bull thesis engaged. If we would break that, I would immediately start telling you about the importance of around 4,300. That's the low from uh, early, uh, excuse me, mid-September, early October. That's also the 200-day moving average. And that would be the next downside objective. If we would get all the way down uh, down there, that's quite a bit. That's an 8 to 10% drop from, uh, from all-time highs there uh, about a week ago. Uh, but again, overall, first things first, 4,550 is a level I'd be uh, paying attention to. Boy, we, we have very little time here, but I'm, I have to show you maybe one or two more charts. The chart of Bitcoin is a very interesting one because you've seen plenty of rotation. Now, the challenge I have with the chart of Bitcoin 
is the bearish momentum divergence. We've seen that three times, I think, as clearly as we did October into November. We saw this in August. We saw this February into March. Each of those times made a new swing high, and then it was a pretty painful uh, you know, next uh, next run here with the, you know, sort of a muted pullback in September, much more of a drawn down, drawn out, excuse me, drawn out uh, pullback in uh, in April into May and June. So overall, the fact that we've seen that same bearish divergence tells me upside momentum has dissipated. This is showing more risk off to me. And again, we're bouncing off of 54,000, bouncing a bit higher, but we continue to make lower highs and uh, and lower lows right now, especially on that tactical time frame. Look to see if that uh, if that pattern can reverse. And it's interesting to note that the RSI bounced off of 40 when uh, we hit 54,000. Maybe that is the new level to uh, to pay attention to as we uh, as we go lower. Last thing I want to show you very quickly was the uh, VIX. Need to jump around just a second here, and then we're going to get to sectors. Here's a chart of the VIX. So we spiked pretty high, and the VIX uh, on Friday, given the sell-off that you saw, that was the highest reading that we've seen uh, since February, actually, of, uh, of 2021, or January, really, was when we uh, spiked higher in the VIX. We had that pullback in, uh, in late January. So this is one of the highest readings we've seen year to date, certainly an elevated reading from where we've been. That lines up with, with previous pullbacks. Getting above 20 to 22 has been fairly rare. Every time that's happened so far in 2021, it's been an incredibly viable pullback. So if we would continue to sell off from here and make new lows or you know accelerate to the downside, that would be a very different feel to this market than we have seen the entire year uh, 2021, where a spike of the VIX in the uh, in the mid 20s has been an incredibly viable pullback before the next leg higher. I tend to think of it that way until proven otherwise. Um, you know, it's worth noting on the S and P. You could argue this is a bit of a bearish divergence, although it wasn't as much of a a uh, higher close. It was in a higher intraday high, but not really a higher close, which would make me a little more confident that that's a bearish divergence. But worth noting the dissipating momentum as the S&P made new highs uh, in the last week or two. We need to move on. Go to uh, sector setups, which is our second major uh, um, uh, segment of the show here. You know, we talk about the big picture, the S&P not too far off of all time highs. The pullback on Friday, certainly severe and sudden, a reasonable reaction to the prospect of, uh, of, uh, of further coronavirus implications for the economy, the economic conditions and impact on consumer spending, consumer behavior, uh, but overall still not too far off of all time highs. Let's look at the S&P sectors. Now today, for example, you have technology working very well. And let's start there because what we've talked about in recent weeks is the XLK, the technology sector, making a clockwise rotation to the right side of the uh, of the Y axis here. And again, the crosshairs are the S&P 500. That's the benchmark up and to the right and particularly heading northeast is a strengthening trend with improving uh, momentum heading southwest, uh, you know, to the left of the uh, y axis is something with a deteriorating trend on on increasing negative momentum actually right so stronger trends heading northeast and in the uh, green quadrant hopefully uh, you know southwest and in the lagging quadrant something in general to uh, to want to avoid a clockwise rotation to the right of the y axis i've found to be one of the most effective techniques and i've talked with julius de kempner who created this visualization years ago many times about that pattern where you see that clockwise rotation to the right of the zero line we're seeing that play out with the xlk over the last uh, month or so you saw the xlk as one of the strongest uh, sectors if you rewind a little bit uh here you can see as it was rotating northeast you can see it then heading as the market corrected there uh, going into October, it gets into the weakening quadrant heading southwest. But look at how healthcare has continued further on to the uh, to the southwest going into the lagging quadrant. Compare that to technology, which is rotated uh, back to the northeast, uh, heading in a position of strength. So overall, out of all the 11 S&P sectors, technology certainly appears to be one of the, if not the technically strongest, uh, certainly one of the top three. Uh, the other two that are uh, strongest on the uh, relative rotation graph right now, the energy sector. What's interesting there, you've had a lot of actionable pullbacks. When I'm looking at charts of uh, like DVN, Apache, ConocoPhillips, these are stocks that have had good long-term runs. They've pulled back to like the 50-day moving average or to previous support, potentially uh, you know preparing for the next leg higher. I think that's a really compelling uh, you know sector. Whereas technology, you could argue a lot of those stocks are relatively extended right now. You can't say that for a lot of energy names. It actually pulled back pretty well. Could be setting up for next like higher. Consumer discretionary is a fascinating sector. It's sort of, uh, you know, here in the leading quadrant as well, but you have some really strong charts and some not so strong charts and sort of a bunch of things in the middle. I mean, groups that 
tend to look pretty well, screen pretty well. Things like, uh, you know, auto parts would come to mind, something like uh, AZO, even like tractor supply company or something like that with these long uh, uptrends. Uh, you know, Ford, uh, GM, potentially some strong charts. They're pulling back a little bit here this week after having some pretty nice runs, but charts like Tesla uh, holding up obviously very well and having some pretty, pretty decent uh, trends. We're going to get to some of the charts within that sector, particularly things like gambling names, uh, hotels, airlines uh, and industrials, but related to that travel and tourism uh, uh, thesis. So that's sort of the sector look that I would look at. What, what do you tend to avoid? It's things that are heading southwest, particularly in the lagging quadrant. If there's a sector that it's really easy to not like at the sector level, I would say communication services, probably it. You have some really ugly charts in there, things like AT&T, Verizon, uh, the media names, entertainment names, rotating lower, things like Disney that had the opportunity to hold support and have failed. Now you have some decent charts in there and it's a, it's a handful, but it's things like, uh, you know, Live Nation, Facebook, Alphabet, all uh, with pretty good trends. Those are the outliers. The average chart within communication services looks pretty bad. And that's why the uh, sector is down there uh, to the left. Let's look at the 11 S&P sectors here before the break uh, on the uh, candle glance function. This is a really good way to take any list of anything, any list of tickers and throw them uh, on the screen together, see what patterns you can merge. And my question to you as we go into the break, which of these sectors have pulled back to their 50-day moving averages? Things like financials, things like industrials, things like energy. Which ones have broken down through support levels? There's only one of the 11 S&P sectors below their 200-day moving average. It's communication services in the upper left. And which are the ones that I've not described yet? Those arguably are the ones that have the strongest trends right now. And it's notably technology, real estate. Uh, uh, where else was I looking? Utilities, I hesitate because it's so far off of the previous highs. Consumer discretionary, right? And these are some of the charts that are holding up very well that haven't even tested their 50-day moving average uh, yet and overall are rotating in a position of strength. That's where you tend to look opportunistically. Uh, resilient trends holding up well in the face of uh, market dislocation. Those are a couple of the ones that are uh, drawing my attention here. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with my next segment, Shifting Stocks. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's great to be back with you live here on Stock Charts TV. We look forward to lots of great discussions here in the coming weeks and coming months. A couple of quick announcements before we get to our next segment. Number one, we love to hear from you. Feedback on our show, feedback on your host, feedback on our guests, all very welcome, but particularly questions that you're running into as you're trying to navigate these markets using technical analysis, potentially using the Stock Charts platform. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. That is the best way to get your questions to us. We're also on Twitter. Just tag us in a comment at final bar SCTV. We're on YouTube. Just put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts channel. We'd love to hear from you. We hope to answer one of your questions live on the air on our next uh, mailbag segment on Tuesday's show of this week. Also go to stockchartstv.com. That is our on-demand platform. Great content, special events like The Pitch, airing a little later today and, uh, and running most months this year. Uh, our year-end uh, coming up, uh, year-end programming in December, our market outlook specials coming up in January, and so much more. Go to stockchartstv.com. You can use your email address to set up a free account and watch all of our great content. Also on your mobile device, just search on the app stores for Stock Charts TV On Demand. Our next segment is called Shifting Stocks. This completes our three-pronged approach to market analysis. We talk, started with the big picture, talked about the S&P, the importance of that 4550 level, which I, I, I maintain is a really important one to key in on. Uh, we talked about sector rotation and some of the strength that you're seeing in technology, consumer discretionary, energy, uh, with some uh, actionable pullbacks, particularly in those last two uh, sectors. Now we complete our three-pronged uh, approach by going with individual names. And this really mirrors my own weekly process of, of going macro to micro. I start this process myself on Thursday, Thursday, Friday, a little bit over the weekend, then into Monday, I complete this move looking at individual names and, and includes a look at the, uh, the entire S&P 500 chart by chart. And uh, the charts I'm about to show you here really come out of that last part of the, uh, of the process. 
We're going to start with technology. So, you know, again, when I'm looking at top down uh, and looking at sectors, uh, technology certainly has a lot to like in terms of the strength of the trend, the relative performance, which has overall been very robust. But when you look bottom up as well, I think you find a lot of really compelling charts within the, uh, within the technology uh, space. It's worth noting, I think seven of the top 10 scooter ranked stocks in the large cap universe are all in technology. About half of those, four out of the seven are in the uh, semiconductor space. Things like NVIDIA and AMD, Xilinx. Now, hopefully those are not a surprise because we've been talking about these most of the time when I have a ch time to, uh, chance to talk about individual names, I'm probably throwing one of these up to represent just the resilience of some of these trends, right? Some of these charts have just been very good. And if you tell me, well, it's too extended, well, should I be buying uh, because it's already had a pretty good run? You could identify points on a lot of these charts where you could have made the same argument. NVIDIA, quote unquote, has been overextended for quite some time. And it's still any of those times going back have been decent times to buy this uh, stock before it continues uh, upward. So I'm, I I've learned to not be afraid of buying the new highs list to follow trends that are working and just make sure you clearly define your risk. So on, on a name like this, if you haven't been in there yet, I don't think it's necessarily too late as long as you define your uh, your risk effectively. And AMD is uh, is one of those as well. With a nice continued run, the relative strength has been very, very uh, strong. There are a lot of those uh, names within there uh, with consistent uptrends. Other things within technology that I think are worth paying attention to are some of the ones that are maybe a little earlier on. Uh, as well. So something like Adobe, which has had a, you know, a bit of a pullback there September into October, uh, along with a lot of names has now regrouped uh, to those previous highs, just getting back above there uh, today. 700 was the peak that we uh, hit last week. We certainly look to see if there's a break above that level, but overall uh, improving in terms of price and, uh, and relative performance. Akamai is another one, AKAM. This is a little different. A lot of those charts feel, uh, you know, have had pretty good runs, particularly in semiconductors. This is something that has had a bit of a longer, more protracted pullback. Didn't just pull back in September. It actually had a, uh, had a bit of a downswing August, September into early October. But now that pattern has changed from lower lows to higher lows, from lower highs to higher highs. I like the rotation higher. I like the RSI getting above 60, which is more uh, sign of a bull market phase and a nice potential rotation with further upside potential as well. And then this is the chart that I had up as I just got started, Cadence. Uh, and again, it has had a nice run for sure, but I like the rotation higher and the improving uh, relative strength there. Now with all of these, I think the concern is particularly on the weekly chart, you'll see the, uh, the bearish divergence here, higher highs in price, lower peaks in momentum. That is certainly a cause for concern. And again, what that tells me not necessarily to be selling something just because you see a divergence. It reminds me to clearly define my downside risk. So a chart like this is just fine. Make sure you define where that chart starts to not look fine. And then you minimize your downside risk. You maximize the upside potential and you hopefully lock in any further gains uh, from here. Other things I would say in terms of other, uh, you know, viable pullbacks, uh, you know, something like Tyler Technologies has had a pretty good run. The relative strength has been good. Pull back a little bit to its 50 day moving average, bouncing a little bit off there uh, today, which could be an interesting one. And then Salesforce.com is another one. Uh, nice upturn. It actually looks like a lot of the energy stocks in, in some ways, right? With a nice rotation higher, pull back to an ascending 50 day moving average, bouncing off of there today. That's a good long term chart with potentially the chance to buy it on a, on a bit of a sale off of the. Uh, all-time highs around 310 there. So some interesting charts uh, in different phases. They aren't just all up and to the right. Uh, there, there's some ones that are working. I think the ones that I would still be uh, nervous about would be payment process or something like uh, you know, GPN. There's a lot, a lot not to like on a chart like this, making new lows uh, you know, below two downward sloping moving averages. It's hard for me to get excited about uh, a chart like this when there are so many other charts that are worth uh, paying attention to. Going in a completely random order on things that uh, that I find interesting, you know, in uh, industrials are a really interesting sector. You have charts like RSG. These are the uh, it's called it's a group called Waste and Disposal Services. Names you're probably familiar with. Maybe that pick up your garbage on a weekly basis. You have Republic. Uh, we have a uh, waste management. WNM is another one. Uh, these are with strong upward trends with nice uh, relative performance. Uh, waste management was highlighted by one of my guests here not too long ago. I want to say Joe Duarte when he was on my show a couple of weeks ago, highlighted WM. I think it's a pretty decent chart. I agree with him on, uh, on that one. Uh, so strong charts in there. I tell you what does not look as strong are things like airlines. Now, these uh, stocks all got hit on Friday and really didn't regain things, uh, regain any momentum today. These are the stocks that are going to feel the pain given uh, any sort of heightened anxiety or 
uh, you know, uh, or concern about the, uh, the new Omicron variant and how that might impact travel and impact tourism and impact uh, how we uh, how we all get around and how we think of uh, think of uh, the uh, the environment right now. Uh, so airlines all uh, most of them breaking down through support levels. I'm showing UAL, but I think this could easily be Southwest or American or any of these other charts. Many of them showed signs of promise and signs of strength in uh, early to mid uh, November, but then you saw them rotate uh, lower here uh, last week. Testing support, but I would argue potentially failing through support there and a lack of bounce today. I think is probably the most concerning part of that uh, chart. A lot of names pulled back on Friday, bounced very nicely today and sort of shrugged off those short -term, uh, that, that short-term weakness. You're not seeing that necessarily on the chart of uh, UAL and some of the other uh, airlines. Boy, we don't, but time goes so quickly on these uh, on the show here. I'll finish with uh, going back to consumer discretionary. So many charts to like in here. Tractor supply company is sort of my standard example I think are interesting to look at, but some really compelling charts here in uh, automobiles. Look at GM here, right? So we talked about the recovery in the traditional automakers, Ford and GM. GM is testing previous resistance, made a new high there in April, pulled back, retested that same level in June, pulled back, made a new swing low, now regained those uh, previous highs, but have failed, uh, failed uh, an attempt to follow through to the upside, now pulling back a little bit until something like GM can get above 65 and stay there. That's sort of the level where you want to see uh, it holding. That's the breakout level. It's not been able to do so yet, and I would, I would certainly be watching it. We'll finish with the chart of Tesla. That is not the right ticker. Here we go. When we look at this one, this is called a bull pennant. So this is a nice run higher. You call that the flagpole. You have a short-term pattern of lower highs and higher lows. Generally speaking, that's a consolidation pattern. And generally speaking, that's a continuation pattern, which means usually after a big run higher and this sort of, uh, of uh, equilibrium, this sort of uh, coil pattern usually resolves to the upside. So you look for a break above that resistance using the uh, the previous swing highs, and that should indicate much further upside for Tesla. You have to get above that uh, that uh, resistance level, which we did not quite do today, even though it, uh, the stock was up 5%. You need to see further upside, but that's certainly a chart to be watching with further upside potential, obviously in a key name with a lot of people, a lot of eyeballs uh, on that chart. We need to wrap the show though, folks, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one, we missed our opportunity on Friday because we didn't do a show, but we missed our opportunity to highlight the uh, S&P market trend model. This is a trend following model that I've uh, used recently tweaked the medium term uh, setting on here, but overall you have long term, medium term and short term based on weekly exponential moving averages. The short term model on Friday, all that weakness on Friday triggered the short term model to go negative. So at this point, I don't update it until Friday after the close. So at this point, you have the long term model bullish, the medium term model bullish, the short term model bearish after breaking down. So until proven otherwise, until we close back above the five week EMA, uh, that remains a uh, short term, negative, medium term, long term, positive. Second chart we'll look at is the twos versus tens. Our last show, which was Tuesday of last week, we highlighted the financial sector and used the uh, 10 year yield, the dollar sign TNX, which I would argue is probably the most important chart I would be following besides the S&P, some of the major charts we follow just to understand uh, rotations and understand leadership themes. However, if you look at the shape of the yield curve, this is twos minus tens. You can see that why, while uh, the 10 year yield has held up very well, you can see that the yield curve has actually been flattening. And that means the spread between the two-year point and the 10-year point is narrowing. And that means overall the yield curve is less and less steep. That tends to be a headwind for the financial sector when the uh, when the yield curve is flattening, because that is literally their business model is borrowing at the short term and uh, and lending out at the uh, at the long term. And as a result, that is hurting the financial sector. This is the relative performance of the XLF versus the XLY. I think the financial sector, there are plenty of charts that are setting up in a pretty compelling way. Uh, some of the banks, for example, testing resist uh, resistance and potentially going to break out. But you really would probably need to see this uh, this ratio, this uh, the spread between twos and tens rotate higher if financials have any opportunity or any uh, promise of starting to outperform here going forward. Finally, I'll highlight one of the many actionable charts out here. We didn't even get to this one, AXP. We didn't get to too many financial stocks. There are plenty of uh, financial names holding up okay. The uh, AXP chart concerns me a little bit. Lows in June, August, and September retested along with a break of the 200-day moving average on Friday, following through to the downside today. Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. As a reminder, the pitch, our next episode of that 
airs today, 5 p.m. Eastern on Stock Charts TV. So don't miss it. And make sure you go back to uh, check out our previous episodes. For Stock Charts, I'm Dave Keller. Have a good one. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.